Well, welcome this morning to our first ever Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday at Chapel Street Church, Mill Creek. It's kind of an exciting day. Yeah, we can. I'm pretty, uh, pretty pumped up about it. In fact, I, um, it, it is so good to be here with you all. I, I, I love the opportunity that we have to meet and gather and to learn together and grow together. And I love the opportunity to celebrate um, Resurrection Sunday and the power of the cross and the power of the empty tomb. And I, uh, I was thinking about this this week and kind of from a pastoral perspective, um, like today's kind of a big day, you know. It's like the day that you don't really want to like uh, drop the ball as far as the sermon goes or like um, mess things up. You might have visitors and guests and kind of want to put your best foot forward. And so there's sometimes a lot of pressure that we can like put on ourselves as we think about Easter Sunday. And Pastor Jeff and I were talking about this earlier this week and just thinking about it. And, and, and as we were talking about it, he's like, you know, what? it's so funny because you think about the story that we're telling. This, this infinite, all-creator God who has decided by his grace and mercy that he is going to intersect himself into our lives. He's going to become one of us and, and dwell among us. And then, despite having all authority, being sovereign, he is going to subject himself to human authorities who will abuse power and, and act unjustly. And he'll subject himself even to the point of being willing to be crucified on a Roman cross and then raises from the dead. Turns out the story doesn't need me to be impressive, right? It doesn't need me to embellish anything. I mean, the story stands on its own, what he's done and the power of that. So what my prayer really for us this morning, Jesus tells this parable in Matthew 13. It's called the parable of the sower, and maybe you've heard it before, but he uses this agricultural sort of model or example, and he talks about this, this uh, farmer who is throwing seed out in the field and how some of it lands on really, really hard soil, and it never even penetrates the ground. It just sort of bounces off, and the sun dries it up, and it's gone. And then there's a second soil where it, it does get rooted, but the roots are really shallow. And so the message kind of takes hold, but it doesn't last because, because the sun, once again, when the heat of the moment is on, it withers and fades. Then he talks about a third soil where, where again, it takes root and it grows up, but it's surrounded by all sorts of weeds, the commotion of life and everything else, and it chokes it out, and, and again, it doesn't last. But then he talks about a fourth soil, what he calls the good soil where the message lands, the seed lands, and it, it takes root, and the, the roots go down deep, and there's substance, and it grows. It even talks about that it multiplies itself. So my prayer for us today as we think about the resurrection, what Christ has accomplished, is that our hearts would just be good soil. I, I, I mean, I'm praying that for myself, but I'm praying that for us as a community, that we'd be ready to receive what Christ has done for us and in our hearts and lives. And so I'm going to pray towards that end and, and we'll dig in. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we know that you are good and that you love us. So God, today, as we look at what you accomplish, what you've done, Lord, I pray that it would penetrate our hearts, that it would land on good soil and that we would be transformed um, because of who you are and what you accomplished. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. This morning, as we, as we think about the resurrection together, we think about the fact that Jesus walked out of the tomb on that, on that morning so long ago. I, I want us to think about it as a turning point in our lives. And, and to think about the significant turning points that we experience, those moments that, that change our trajectory. They change the course of, of our lives. Oftentimes, these are great things, great moments that we celebrate. It can be a wedding, or it can be the birth of a child, right? When you are there in those moments, you know your life is never going to be the same after that. Um, it could be a, a, a promotion at work, or even better yet, it can be that like landing of that dream job, that job that you were always meant for. It can be retirement, it could be a, a significant move, it can be all kinds of things. The list could go on and on and on, and these, these moments sort of shape our lives. But on the flip side of that, sometimes these moments come out of 
difficulty, um, even pain. Sometimes they come as the result of, of a loss where someone who has been significant to us is no longer there to guide and lead us. Sometimes these, these transformative, these, these, these turning points in our lives come when a relationship just disintegrates and it's hard and it's painful. Sometimes it comes when expectations and dreams aren't being realized and we move in a direction that we never saw ourselves going. And sometimes ultimately that direction is good. It takes us to a positive result, but the, the catalyst for it, what caused us to head that direction, is painful. I have a good friend um, from college that he was several years older than me. As a matter of fact, I've talked about him before um, in, in a sermon, but he would talk about his story as a high school student and, and a graduate where he'd gotten um, dangerously addicted to drugs. I mean, it was ruling his life, and it, to the point where he found himself standing before a judge who said, look, you can either enter this rehab facility that I am choosing for you, or you can go to jail. Those were his options, and so much to his, his, demi or his lack of desire, he chose the rehab facility as the better two options. He didn't want to go there. What he didn't know is a faith-based facility, and that's where he ultimately met Jesus, and he talks about that time in his life. He says, it was the worst time of my life. I was at the lowest point, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. See, oftentimes when we think about what we're, what we're looking at in terms of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, everything that transpires here, it is this catastrophic injustice, and yet it is the best thing that's ever happened to us. In fact, I would um, suggest that of all the turning points that we can experience in our lives, the, the most powerful, the most transformative that we will ever encounter is the truth of the empty grave. See, this, this moment, this event, when all hope seemed lost, when the innocence of God was, was put on display on a Roman cross, when, when defeat was certain and death was irreversible, when all of that is undone, when the stone is rolled away, when light breaks into the darkness, when, when death is defeated, this is the moment that changes everything. So more importantly, I would say that this is the moment, it's this reality, this single event that has the ability to change us in the most powerful way possible. And this is the power of the resurrection. Last week, Pastor Jeff preached from, on Palm Sunday from Matthew chapter 16 on a question that he asked his disciples. Simply put, he said, who do you say that I am? This morning, I want us to take a similar approach as we look at a question that was spoken to those who first arrived on the empty tomb that Easter morning so many years ago. That spoken by the angels when he asked them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? This is Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We're going to read the first eight verses together. It says, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. See, this is the moment. This is the moment that changes everything. The impact of this question that's asked of these women some 2,000 years ago continues to reorient our lives in the here and now as we encounter the truth of the empty tomb, as we encounter the reality of the resurrected Jesus in our own lives. And this morning, I want to just suggest a couple ways, a couple turning points that the truth of the, the resurrection has on us. And before we get into that, I just want to say I'm not 
going to approach this this morning from like a, an apologetic kind of way. I'm not, I'm not going to be presenting evidence as to why we can look at the resurrection as a historical valid event, although that would be worthwhile. I'm going to operate from the assumption, obviously, as, as a pastor, my faith is in Jesus. I believe that this is a real historic event, and that's caused these turning points to happen in our lives. And so let's begin by looking at how the resurrection reorients our expectations. It reorients our expectations. I, I think one of the things that I love about sports, I'm a sports fan, you guys have heard me talk about this before, is we all love the story of an underdog, right? And how many of you have followed the Loyola journey over the last several weeks? That's been just fun. Like we all, we all get engaged in that. As Chicagoans, we all sort of look at that and are excited about it. I was rooting for them last night, both as a Loyola hopeful and also as a hater of Michigan. Like I wanted, <laughs> I wanted Loyola to win that game, right? But the reason that we follow those stories so intently, the reason that they stick out to us so much is because they, they exceed our expectation. You look at that group of players and you see them in comparison to the rest and you think that's not that's not what they're capable of. You would almost say, we didn't know they could do that. This is beyond their ability. We love this as parents. When our kids do something that, that surprises us, they demonstrate a part of an ability that we didn't know was there, and you say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that you could do this. And this is exactly sort of the response that, that we see unfolding here on that morning so long ago, Jesus is expanding our expectations. Look again at verse 1. He says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. This is important because we recognize that they're, they're approaching that morning not to go check and see if Jesus has risen from the dead yet. That's not their expectation. In fact, they're going to, to find a body. Their expectation is to find a body. They're coming in order to place spices on a corpse as a part of their burial process. But as they arrive, they're surprised by what they see around them. Verse 2 says that the stone had been rolled away. So this massive stone that had been placed in front of the grave that takes several men that's rolled into a ditch has now been removed. It's gone, but it goes beyond there. They walk in later in the same verse. It says they walk into the tomb and they did not find the body. So imagine for a moment, all of the emotion, all of the concern, all of the questions that they're experiencing, who took him, why would they do that? What would they possibly want with his body? And then perhaps most shocking of all, Two men in dazzling apparel, it describes them, which is just kind of a funny way to say that. Luke later refers to them in the same chapter, identifies them as angels, asks this question to these three women here in this text. Why do you seek the living among the dead? You see, this is, this is the transformative moment. This is when everything changes. He goes on, he says, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And then in verse 8, here it comes. And they remembered his words. See, this is the shift. This is the moment. And it's really just the beginning where they connect to Jesus' ultimate mission. They begin to understand his, his ultimate purpose. This is, this is when they begin to have their expectations reoriented, which is really even just not strong enough way to say it. See, their vision, their understanding of Jesus up to this point was too small. They, they wanted a Messiah who would come and who would free Israel from the oppression of Rome. They, they wanted to return, to be reestablished as a nation, to experience once a good, the presence of, of God dwelling among them as they had in the promised land. They wanted to come back to the peace that they had known before, but this isn't why Jesus came. He didn't come to bring freedom from Rome. He, he came to bring freedom from sin. 
He, he didn't come to, to dwell among them. He came to dwell in them. He didn't come to offer the sort of peace that we experience in our lives in the absence of conflict. He came to bring the kind of peace that we experience in the, in the absence of shame and guilt and fear of judgment. See, Jesus had come to do so much more. The resurrection is about so much more than what they anticipated. And so in doing so, Jesus reorients our expectations. He enlarges them. I think far too often we have a tendency, I have a tendency to settle for this diluted version of Jesus. Sort of the, the idea that he wants to make us better people, that, that you and I can have a more meaningful life in Jesus. That's not why Jesus died on the cross. That's not what he came to accomplish. That's sort of looking for the living among the dead kind of approach. We have too small, we've diluted our understanding of Jesus. He came to bring us life. He came, he came to cause what he says is make us new creations. He came to take that which was spiritually dead and make us alive again. And in order to do it, in order to do all of that, he would conquer death itself on our behalf. Don't, don't settle for a diminished view of Jesus. Increase your expectations. That's what the resurrection does for us. That's, that's one of the ways it's a turning point in our lives. Additionally, then, we understand that the resurrection validates our hope. It validates our hope. I, uh, I have a, uh, a daughter who will remain nameless to protect the guilty, but um, she is a master negotiator has been from day one, from birth. Like if, if she wants, like she's always working an angle for 30 extra minutes before bedtime, before some extra dessert to control what's happening on the TV and all of that, she's always been able to just sort of like wear us down. In fact, if I am ever kidnapped and held for ransom, I want you to find this one particular, some of you know who she is, and find this one particular daughter and send her in because she will wear them down. She's. <laughs> She's that good, you know. But I remember as a small child, as a toddler, sometimes she would say stuff to me like, Daddy, I'll give you $100 if you let me stay up late tonight, which I would have taken that deal <laughs> in a heartbeat. But I knew that she didn't have the ability to fulfill that promise. I, I knew that what she was offering was greater than what she had the capacity to give. See, how do you, why do you trust anyone? Think about someone that you trust. That if they were to say, hey, I'm going to do this, you're like, I'm certain they're coming through. What makes you confident in that? Chances are there's been something that they've done in your history, in your life together, that has convinced you that they'll be able to do it again, right? I mean, the people that we trust most, we've seen it from them. See, this is what Jesus offers us here and, and the resurrection. This is the, if you think about what the disciples, again, are feeling in this moment, before, before they come to the empty tomb, following the crucifixion, the, the, the promises that they understood in their head about Jesus now feel larger than his ability to fulfill them. And as a result, their hope is gone. They've been wrong about it. They must have been wrong about who he was or why he came or, or, or what he was there to do, what they were a part of. But now, the grave is empty. The tomb has been destroyed. Jesus has walked out. He's conquered death. And in doing so, he now validates our hope. See, it confirms it in verse 7. Jesus alludes to, or the angel, excuse me, alludes to this conversation that Jesus had had with the disciples earlier. In Luke chapter 9, it was part of this conversation is what Pastor Jeff talked about last week, where Jesus asked the, the disciples, who do you say that I am? And then later on in, in chapter 9, verse 22, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. See, Jesus in this very overt, very um, straightforward manner says exactly what's going to happen and what he is ultimately going to do. But in the moment that it's happening, when it's all transpiring, they forget what Jesus has promised or they don't believe he can do it. They're looking at the situation and saying, I don't think he can do that. See, now hope begins to 
to re-enter. Now they begin to understand in this moment when they look and the grave clothes are there and there's no one in them. Because Jesus is the one. He is the only one who has all power and authority of God himself to pay the price, the penalty for sin, and to overcome death and walk out of the grave. This is the moment. If you think about for a second, all the ways that as a Christian we, we place our faith in Jesus, all the things that we trust him for, I mean, we, we trust him for new life, what, what we refer to as life in the full. Jesus said, whoever wants to save my life will lose it, but, but whosoever loses their life for me will find it. We, we trust that, that Jesus is going to make us acceptable in front of a, a holy God. We trust that we will remain in his love and that, that, that he will never leave us. We trust him for our salvation. That, that we will be um, acceptable in God's presence, that our sin will be wiped away. That's, that is placing a great deal of hope in one place. What gives us the ability to do that? Why would we, why would we do that? Because we have the resurrection to validate that he can do what he said he'll do. Because we have the hope of that promise. And he's confirmed it by overcoming death itself. Think for a moment about what you place your hope in. About, about where you place your, your confidence. Does that thing, that person, whatever that is, have the power of the resurrection to validate it? Because that's what, that's what Jesus accomplished on our behalf. Thirdly, then we see that the resurrection gives us new purpose. It gives us new purpose. I, uh, I have a good friend of mine, um, and some of you know him. His name is Steve Higgins, and, and I have been a part of doing ministry with him for almost 20 years now. He runs the camp that many of our students go to up in Baraboo, Wisconsin, for their winter retreats and fall retreats and different events that, that we do. But about 15 years ago, he was, we were both living in Wheaton, he was living the prototypical suburban life. He, he never actually lived that prototypical of a suburban life, but he, he's kind of a crazy guy. Like, he's always more energetic than the rest of us in the room. But at this moment, 15 years ago, he decided to sell everything that he owned and move up to Baraboo and buy this camp and start running this facility for students. Um, huge leap of faith. And you're kind of like, why would you do this? Like, what, what would empower somebody? What would give them the strength to be able to do this? See, but what you had to know about him was his story. Because when Higgins was a teenager, he got invited to a church. In fact, nobody in his family had a, a faith background at all. He walked on his own there. But in the course of that church, he met Jesus. He came to faith in Christ, and he started to invite his little brothers and sisters to come along with him. And then it turns out that his brothers and sisters came to faith in Jesus. And they started to say, hey, Mom and Dad, you got to you got to come with us. you got to experience this. And they wanted to kind of curious, what's going on here? And so they went, and they came to faith in Jesus. And, and then his parents started talking to his grandparents and said, hey, this radical thing is happening in our family, and Jesus is doing all this incredible stuff. you gotta, you got to come see this. And so out of sheer curiosity, the grandparents get involved. Like, Higgins says, I'm a third-generation reverse Christian <laughs> because, some, because somebody created space for me. And because I believe that God can meet us in nature and create, I'm going I'm to give up everything, I'm going to sell it, we're going to move my family, we're going to all, we're going to do this, we're going to create space for students to be there. You see, his story, his experience gave him new purpose. Look at what transpires here in, in chapter 24. Picking things back up in verse 8, it says, they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who were with them, who told these things to the apostle. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now jump down to the end of the chapter. This is verse 44. Jesus has now appeared to to the rest of the disciples he has shown and met with them and 
and, and confirmed in them that the, that the truth of the resurrection is real. And listen to what he tells them. He said, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. See here, Jesus completely now reorients their purpose. And I, and I told you earlier that I'm not going to do like a, a sort of a, a review of all the evidence as to why we can believe that the resurrection is a real historical event that took place. But if we were going to get into that, I think that one of the primary points of evidence that I would suggest is exactly what we see transpire in the life of the disciples, of those who are there, those who are experiencing the resurrection firsthand, the change that takes place in them, because the disciples are often hiding. They, they are living in fear that what has happened to Jesus is going to happen to them. But immediately following this encounter with the angels, this, these women go back and they begin to tell their friends and say, look, the, the tomb is empty. And, and Peter and, and, and some of the other gospels, like John, they run there, they see it for themselves, and they begin to spread the word. They go back and tell the rest of the disciples, and then Jesus come to the disciples, and they're able to touch his hands and his feet, feel his wounds. They become convinced, and then they spend the rest of their lives going out from that place and telling people, Jesus is alive. He, he's resurrected. You're not going to believe what happened. You need to know this. Jesus completely reorients their purpose. This is, I said at the very outset of this, I, mean, I made the assertion that the most transformative, most powerful turning point that we experience in our lives is an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and we see it lived out in the lives of the disciples. Because we can't experience that and be unmoved. You just can't. It, it becomes, it changes our purpose. It sends us out to tell the story. It's like any other incredibly good news that we have in life. The natural thing that we do with that is, is we tell the people that we love, the people that are around us, hey, this has happened. You need to know this. Be aware of this. And this is exactly what we see being lived out in the lives of the disciples. They go out, they share it, they let others know. Other people begin to experience it for themselves, and then they start telling the news. It gives us something greater. This is, this is the story of the rest of the New Testament from this point forward. This is the story of the church. It's people who have experienced the resurrection of Jesus, who have met with him, who have come to believe in him. This is my story. I became convinced of what he did, what he accomplished on the cross, and felt called to spend my life telling that story, sharing that story. It reorients our purpose. These men and women who found the tomb empty on that day have never been the same. They've been sharing the story, telling people that Jesus laid down his life on a, on a Roman cross in order to pay our penalty. To pay, to pay the debt that I owed because of my sin so that, so that we could have life. It gives us a greater purpose. Lastly, then we discover that the resurrection secures our future. It secures our future. And, and really, if you're only going to hear one thing from me today, I, I want you to hear this. Because I, I, I want you to know that above all, uh, why God was willing to send his son as a sacrifice and ultimately what he was going to accomplish on our behalf. This is from the Apostle John who is, um, often refers to himself in his gospel and other places as the one whom Jesus loved. Um, and he writes this in, in 1 John chapter 4. He says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The NIV translate that as the atoning sacrifice, to pay the penalty. See, what, what 
what John wants us to understand is he is telling this story, just as we talked about, as his purpose has been reoriented, he explains what motivated God to do all of this. It's because he loves you. It's, it's because he loves me. He loves us. He loves us and desires that we might live through him. And it's easy sometimes when we're talking about the idea that God loves us. And, and we can do this pastorally all the time where we stand up here and we can tell you how much God, God loves you. But this week when we were meeting for our staff communion, this is a tradition that we have as a Chapel Street Church staff. Pastor Jeff was leading us in this time, and he just said, I don't want you to think about how much God loves other people. He's like, I want you to know that God loves you, me, specifically. Sterling, I want you to know how much God loves you when you take this bread, when you drink this cup, know how much God loves you. Because we can do this. We can look around the room and we can think about how much God loves my kid or we can think about how much God loves the person next to us or we can think about how much God loves this community. But the power of the resurrection tells you how much God loves you. What he was willing to give to demonstrate his love for you. One of the most um, widely read verses in all of scripture is also written by the apostle John. It's in John chapter 3. This is what he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Two things there. He loves you, and he died in order that you might have eternal life with him. See, the resurrection secures our future. It it reveals what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. When we place our faith in Jesus, when we say, I trust you for the forgiveness of sins, this is what he's done. This is what he's accomplished. It's finished. See, my prayer for us today, and we think about, and I know we're going to leave this place and go be with family and do all sorts of things, but my My desire for us today is that we would know and understand the love of Christ. My my desire for you today is that that your heart and your heart of hearts that you would know that God loves you so much that he, he died for you and he overcame death so that you could have life with him. I want you to know that your future in Jesus is secure and the resurrection proves it. This is what the resurrection accomplishes on our behalf. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the opportunity to be here as a community, as your church, to celebrate what you did, what you got done, because you love us that much. I pray that we would know that and understand that this morning, that we would live in light of that. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.